Good morning. Uh, can you hear me back there, Steve? Fantastic. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. I really want to thank all the sponsors uh, who have contributed so generously. I, I also especially want to mention and single out the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, who has been so incredibly helpful to dysgenics uh, since we joined in the last two years. So I want to give you a little presentation this morning. The accent, we're having a lot of variation in accent today. And uh, I, I, I talk pretty quickly, but I will try to slow down as much as I can and, and enunciate accordingly. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the problem that we're trying to address at Dysgenics. Uh, we are working uh, with the intervertebral uh, disc and the vertebral uh, and the spine itself. Uh, the spine is composed of vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc, and the disc is composed of three distinct regions, an end, an end plate, a nucleus propulsus, and an annulus fibrosus. It is a, con a very complex architecture, which allows for multi-axial mo motion and compression. The problem is that discs degenerate over time due to chronic injury and or acute injury. And con chronic injury is usually uh, results in degeneration, whereas acute injury results in herniation. Uh, as you can see there on the uh, uh, micrographs there, the uh, degenerated disc on the left, it shows a, a degeneration and dehydration and a collapse, which puts pressure on the nerve roots and the spinal cord. And on the right, a disc herniation showing a, a herniation of the, of the disc into the spinal cord, which results usually about 70% of the time in, a, in an immediate demand for a surgical procedure. If you look at the socioeconomic of, uh, socioeconomics of back pain, it's about a $100 billion spend. It's the second largest reason we visit a surgeon. 15 to 30% of us experience back pain in our lifetime, uh, and the annual increase uh, has gone up 95%, uh, showing the indication of a very active aging population. In terms of the current treatment landscape, it's divided up into mild, moderate, and severe. And that consists of when you have mild back pain, it usually consists of pain medications, uh, advancing to physical therapy, steroid injections. There's also chiropractic and alternative care use. Uh, during moderate back pain, pretty much you're just buying time in hopes that you won't have to do surgery. There are also some mo motion preservation implants that have come to the market. Uh, they really don't do much good except try to delay the onset of what conceivably is a surgical procedure resulting there on the right where you have screws, plates, and rods put in to stop the chronic pain which you're experiencing. Uh, this does nothing when you have this sur these surgical procedures. It relieves symptoms, but it uh, does really nothing to help restore the tissue or restore function per se, and it results in... Uh, uh, further complications usually, uh, adjacent level disease, and usually revision surgery uh, usually in a 10-year time period. So the current unmet medical need is an is a opportunity for disrepair, uh, providing long-term benefit and, and certainly being cost-effective. So Dysgenics is a spinal therapeutics company developing novel off-the-shelf treatments based on tissue engineering and per progenitor cell science to help patients suffering from intervertebral disc disease. So our approach is a regenerative medicine and tissue engineering approach to stimulate the body to regrow tissue using cells, biomaterial, and chemical signals. Uh, we really do believe in the adult stem cell philosophy. We believe stem cells are found throughout the body. They're multipotent, and they're not embryo-derived. And our platform technology is a disc-derived adult excuse me, adult stem cell known as discospheres, where we procure intervertebral disc tissue from adult human donor sources. We have a proprietary multi-step process where we select, expand, and enrich that tissue, and the output being stem and progenitor cells, and we harvest these therapeutic discogenic cells that contain discospheres, and uh, as you can see, the, the confocal mic mic photomicrograph on the right uh, shows uh, agrican and call 2 
And uh, we believe that we have a solution with our injectable discogenic cell therapy where we will inject a dark disc for mild degenerative disease using a scaffold carrier preloaded in a syringe as an off-the-shelf model. It is a non-surgical procedure that would be done in a procedure room much like a discogram or an interdiscal steroid therapy. Our second product that would follow would be the same discogenic cells in a structural scaffold, again, as an off-the-shelf model being used surgically after disectomy. Go this way. So in our proof of concept, concept of both rabbits and uh, pigs, we have shown restoration of disc height uh, using some very rigorous scientific controls in our models. And uh, as you can see, we've restored uh, nice histology in our rabbit. We've treated over 54 rabbit discs uh, with no safety concerns at all, no problems with the rabbits as, and as the pigs as well. Uh, this, this has been great, great proof of concept for us, which has really encouraged us to move the ball forward. In terms of the competition and the treatment continuum, which is in the marketplace now, uh, it mainly consists of steroid injection, spinal fusion, disc arthroplasty, and uh, a new concept of this autologous cellular treatments. Uh, the uh, market is dominated by Medtronic, Stryker, Globus, J&J, &J, and selling on the autologous stem cell side. Uh, the spend in this marketplace uh, utilizing uh, fusion devices uh, constitutes and osteobiologics constitutes about a 15 to 20 uh, billion dollar spend in this country. There is emerging uh, uh, products uh, centered around nucleus replacement using ceramics, hydrogels, polymers, and biologic sealants. Uh, spine wave and spinal restorations we consider in that group and quite frankly uh, they're not meeting with that much success. We believe the near future is nucleus regeneration using stem cells, scaffolds, and growth factors. Obviously, our, our friends from Mesoblast and Isto and ourselves are in this space. Uh, Mesoblast and Isto uh, in, a phase two crop, in a phase two clinical trial at this point. We are in a preclinical development phase, uh, hoping to start our trials first phase one, two next year. So really our difference, uh, we believe that we're truly regenerative. We have consistent safety and efficacy roles, results in animal studies. We have an off-the-shelf allogeneic model. We have a tissue-specific lineage, so we believe that we're homologous uh, uh, therapeutic. We have a very focused indication, and we believe that we will capture early on that non-fusion patient. We can rebuild the disc and reduce pain, and we get a tissue from one donor that we can expand into many, many doses to treat many patients. Obviously, to reduce pain and improve quality of life. If you look at the market, we, we did a very uh, uh, intense uh, look at ICD-9 codes and came up uh, with a growth rate at 4.8%, which we think is a, a fairly conservative growth rate especially considering the, you know, the, the much increased activity of the aging population. We came out with a $4.4 billion market size in the U.S. Uh, this does not include the international market, which we think is one to two times that, and it, and it does not include market penetration due to epidural steroids uh, that are done over 750,000 epidural steroids were done last year, and we think there will be a lot of compression of people that would choose uh, our cell therapy as opposed to a steroid injection, which really works only about 20% of the time. So if you look at our execution, we have a defined regulatory pathway through CBER. Uh, when the government reopens, we're uh, going to submit our final pre-IND, and uh, we prepare for an IND in 214, and we're ex exploring some European options. Uh, Tissue procurement, we have a secured agreement with uh, organ procurement uh, uh, donor organizations, and we're working with those partners to develop uh, good tissue practices. Manufacturing scale up, our additional CGMP process is complete. Uh, clinical manufacturing partners uh, are identified, and we are exploring a go to market uh, uh, with them. Our, with an in-house manufacturing option. We've imp implemented all the CR820 and 211 
Uh, we have uh, one issued patent, both U.S. and internationally, two more pending, more in progress. And obviously, we're going through all the data management and logistics things that are necessary to make all of the above happen. In terms of our team, myself, I have uh, over 30 years of medical device experience, uh, basically based around pedicle screws, plates, and rods. And while uh, I had a lot of success in that, I kept walking out of the OR deeply thankful for the revenue, but, but hoping that there'd be a better way to help people, uh, one of which my wife, who's had a two-level cervical fusion. Uh, myself, uh, and, and then comes Bob Winnelak, who is our chief operating commercialization officer. Bob was the former president of Osteotech and has tremendous expertise in the commercialization of seven or eight products uh, from its inception to, implant to human implantation and commercialization. He also has uh, past uh, engagements with Medtronic and Sophomore Danik. Our chief medical officer is Kevin Foley, who is a neurosurgeon uh, technology guru with 110 issued patents, many of which are licensed by Medtronic. He is the vice chairman of the Sims Murphy Clinic. He continues to practice uh, neurosurgery and take call today. And uh, he is considered by many the father of minimally invasive spine fusion. J.B. Hendrickson is our CFO uh, there in uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, Laura Silverman is with us today. She is our senior manager of uh, R&D, as is Bob Winnelak. And uh, Anthony Mangum serves as our senior analyst for finance and operations. And we have uh, four uh, full-time equivalents uh, all working with us uh, to continue our pre-IND studies into our IND. In terms of our key milestones, we've divided it up into our discosphere technology, our injectable, and our implantable. And as you can see where we are today, we're at our pre I'm sorry, final pre-IND and uh, we're ready to submit that data, and then we will begin our clinical study sometime next year as we continue our product de development and annual, I'm sorry, and animal studies uh, in regard to our surgical product. We expect to be on the market with our injectable uh, sometime mid-218. Uh, we are on track uh, to achieve that. We may be a little early. I'm not going to put too much pressure on Bob and Laura by saying that but we will be there. Uh, and uh, we believe that our uh, injectable, uh, I'm sorry, our surgical product will follow about six, six to nine months later and no pressure there either. So to our bottom line, uh, we believe there's a tremendous unmet medical need for this therapy. We believe we have a scalable off the shelf product, uh, allergenic in nature. We believe there's obviously high rev revenue potential, but uh, really, most importantly, we think it's a tremendous opportunity to help a lot of people with this pervasive disease and restore function and uh, stop pain by restoring disc height. We think that's a, a, a key element to our technology as a key differentiator from us and our ability to help many people. We have strong management commercialization experience and scientific expertise. Uh, we are, uh, have, have funded this company so far through a seed uh, round and a rights offering of those seed partners who have been so encouraged by our results to date. And we're opening a round uh, quarter four of this year. Uh, we have an opportunity for a one-to-one -one, uh, matching grant. Uh, and these uh, dollars will be to fund our phase one, two clinical trial and our ongoing operations. I'm a, I'm a minute 30. Laura, thank you. I want, I want to get noted for that. And if you have any questions, I'd, I would love to answer them at this time. Thank you very much.